All right. Try to do everything in a hurry. And when you do, you make mistakes. Isn't that how it is? All right. Now, let's do this. Push this button. This one. And do that so I can connect to that. And push that, that, this button, that one, don't call me pastor, call me the master button pusher. What'd you think I was doing upstairs all that time? Pushing buttons. This world is all about what? Pushing buttons. And with people, sometimes you push the wrong button. Amen? Amen. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. This is the Laodicean church. Good to see you this morning. Good to see everybody online. Everything going well so far, Michael? With that new computer that we got? And um, so hopefully everything will continue to work properly. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Concerning the Laodicean church, let's read down to get sort of the gist and the context of where I'm going to start when I, what I have up on the screen there. Um, verse 14, Then unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. He says this now to every church, just about, I know thy works, I know, I know you, so you can't hide anything from me, and you can't act like, you can't act like I'm not telling you the truth, because I know you, okay? I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold, I would that thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. We've spent some time talking about that. I even let you in on it. Give your opinion, give your opinion of what lukewarm meant. And I think, I think one of the biggest things today is you are mixing, um, you're mixing, the, you've got one foot in the church one foot in the world. Now, this has gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years. You've always had pseudo-Christians, false brethren, fake Christians. You've always had fake Christians in the church. It's one thing when you have them and... The church, if the church finds out you have some sin, they go through the process like Jesus told us, go to them personally. If they don't repent, then go to them with a witness. If they don't repent, then you bring them before the church. It's one thing. But there is an entire doctrine now that basically allows for people to be one foot in the world and one foot in the church, to, to compromise and to be both. And it's, uh, I, I was not aware of it until Pastor Mike Hutzel brought it to my attention because somebody he knows very well has gotten into this doctrine. It's called the doctrine of extreme grace. And it basically says you can drink all you want. Well, I'm glad Roy's not here now to hear that one. You can drink all you want 
smoke all you want, curse all you want, have an affair on your wife, have multiple affairs on your wife. You can go to bars, go to sports bars, go to pool halls, go to taverns, go to dance places. Go, just be like the world. And the grace of God covers everything automatically. You don't have to do anything. The grace of God will cover everything. That to me is Laodicean. Well, but see, even technically, technically, even in that one, now I know there's a, I know there's some people that believe some way out there stuff on once saved, always saved. When they say once saved, always saved, they mean once prayed, always saved. Um... There's a guy named Steven Anderson. I don't have a problem in the world talking about him because that guy is nuts. Okay? Apparently you've heard of him. He literally believes he will go knock on somebody's door, pound the gospel into them, get them to, re get them to pray the prayer right then and there, count them saved, and basically they can do whatever they want to from then on out. Doesn't matter. They're going to heaven. Now he's not really the, the, the type of extreme grace person I'm thinking of. Um, it's, it's more of a non-fundamental. And Stephen Anderson is a, would be categorized as a fundamentalist, although that's iffy. But it's more of an evangelical ideology. In other words, it's spread out among the big denominations, not just a single little little church like he's got. It's spread out amongst whole denominations that that literally you can do whatever you want. You can you can have you can be hot on one leg, cold on the other. Have be a sinner Sunday afternoon through Saturday night, saved Sunday morning, and everything's just fine. And that, there's going to be a lot of people that's going to wake up on Judgment Day and go, uh-oh, I think I believe the wrong thing. Uh, but anyway, let's move on from that. Verse 17 now. Because thou, is, because thou sayest, uh, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Now, what this church apparently has done is that they have substituted the idea that because God put a lot of people in their pews, and those people brought in a lot of money to the church coffers. And that church is doing well financially. And they have a nice looking building. And they have the nice looking pastor, which I'm not. They have all of that. They have substituted that for godliness. Paul said it. They have, they have made, turned godly. They have said that godliness is gain. Or gain is godliness. Look at our church. Look how many we have in our Sunday school department. Look how many we have coming here. Well, we have thousands and thousands and thousands. And we are, we're reaching people all this, and they, that's what they've done. It looks like they have substituted, they have said, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. They have substituted gain for godliness and salvation. Okay? Now, there are Catholic churches that are very large. 
There are apostate churches that are extremely large. How many people did Jim Jones talk into going, moving down to South America with him? It was almost 800 people, wasn't it? That's how many people he talked in. That's not the total number of people in his church that he had in California. That was how many people he talked into going to that compound in South America where they all drank the Kool-Aid and they all found them dead. One, it all, everybody killed themselves because Jim Jones told them to. Now that's 800 people. Just because you got 800 people doesn't mean that you're, everybody's right with God. Okay, that's the point. So he, they've substituted the fact that they have a lot of people. They've substituted the fact that they have, they've increased uh, or increased with riches and so on uh, with godliness, but it has nothing to do with it. And Jesus said, I know or and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now we're going to deal with some of these in a minute. And I counsel thee the buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that, and that the shame of thy nakedness doth not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Now, two things that Jesus emphasized out of this list. He, he mentioned that they're wretched, that they're miserable, that they're poor, that they're blind, and that they're naked. So he emphasizes, number one, in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Turn to, I don't know if that's next on my list, but yeah, it is on my list. Let me make sure I, I have the right verse there. Nope, I don't. Turn to uh, Isaiah 55. I don't know why it's not on there. I thought I put it in there. Isaiah 55. One of my, one of my favorite passages. Those of you who know me, you know I don't like people who sell salvation. I don't like people who sell the gospel. I don't like people who say they have wonderful, new, magnificent revelations from God that you must have in order to have a good walk with God or to have a, a great marriage or to have success in life that God gave it to them, and then they turn around and sell it to everybody. God didn't sell it to that preacher, did he? No. And, but they're selling it to everybody, and I don't like that. So in Isaiah verse, chapter 55, verse 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Because it's free. There's no exchange of money or works or talents or law keeping or anything that you could do anything that you could give uh, what is that what is that verse in rock of ages cleft for me in my hand no price I bring simply to the cross I cling it's one of my favorite parts of that whole song there is nothing in my hand that I can bring to God that he demands or that he even wants. God made it clear. He said, if, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you that I was hungry. 
Because then you would think, well, I, I fed God. I gave God a bull. I fed God. God was blessed by me. Who was it? Uh, I can never think of his name. He's one of these nuts on TBN. Um, he said he, had a, he was in a vision one time. And him and Jesus was talking. Jesus was crying his eyes out over the state of the church. And this TBN preacher said, Jesus, come over here. Put your head on my shoulder. And he gave Jesus comfort. And I'm going, you idiot. You're a nut. And people believe that stuff. But anyway, uh, verse 2, wherefore, wherefore means why. Wherefore, why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and, la and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, and hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, and a leader, and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knewest not. He's talking about the Gentiles. And nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. How many nickels or how many shekels did Moses charge for everybody to look at the brazen serpent that he made? He didn't put it behind a curtain and say, ten shekels. Drop ten shekels in, you can look at the brazen serpent, and then you can live. He didn't charge anybody anything for it. All they had to do was look at it, and they received salvation. That's all they had to do was believe. Belief is free. Amen? Belief is free. And that's it. That's the gospel right there. That's as pure as it is. So he said, I counsel thee to, to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. What is that gold he's referring to? Let me read a couple verses before Rose rings that bell on me, or, or Sweetie Pie does. Job 28, 12, but where shall wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Where are you going to find, if you're looking for wisdom and you need understanding, what's the best place in the world to go to for it? I'm glad you didn't say like CNN or National Geographic or anything like that. The Bible, Derek! Amen! Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth saith, it is not in me, and the sea saith, it is not with me. Verse 15, it cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir and with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Now I'm going to, I don't do this often. But I'm going to boast about the wisdom of my dad. Okay? And he learned it from his dad. His dad grew up on a sharecropper's farm, poor, poor as dirt. And how many, how many brothers was there, Mom? Nine boys. Nine boys and three girls. And Jesse Hoggard was my grandfather. Very wise, very wise man. And what he passed on to his... Oh, he only had one son. That was my dad. He had one daughter. But he only had one son, and he handed everything down to him. And my dad, Brother George, if there was a lake with one fish in it, my dad could get that fish out of that lake. 
He knew, he knew exactly where it was. And my dad used to aggravate me to death going deer hunting with him. Because sure enough, by about 7 o'clock, I'd hear, Kapow! Next thing I know, I'd see my dad walking across the field, dragging a deer. 7 o'clock, usually, first day, 7 o'clock, every morning, he had him a deer. He knew exactly where they were. Knew where all the squirrels were, all the fish. He knew, he knew how to plant. Knew how to grow a garden as good. And I hated, hated him for that. For growing a garden. Because he made me pick it. And my sister. And I didn't like those beans. I did not like those beans at all. Or those peas. I didn't like them. Now, the okra I didn't mind, but that other stuff I didn't like. But he, he had a wisdom in him that you could not buy with all the money in the world and all the education in the world. You couldn't buy it. He had a wisdom about him. And when he married my mother, they were very poor. And I was always told that if it hadn't been for my dad hunting, fishing, and gardening, everything that we ate came, came about by his hand. Those first few years of their marriage together, everything that our family ate came by the hand of my father. Now that's wisdom that you cannot buy with gold. Okay, now, I said all that to say this. The real wisdom is a wisdom better than that. And it's a wisdom that says God is real. God is the maker of everything in this universe. Without him was not anything made that was made. And that... God has a way to live, a righteous way to live, that if you live that way, 90% 90, 90 of your problems, in fact, if you live God's way, 100% 100 of your problems will be gone. But there's just a wisdom in knowing God that all the professors at MIT, Yale, Harvard, St. Louis University, um, the, what's over in LA, UCLA, all of those, all of those professors who say there is no God, we came about as a result of a big bang, that, that knowledge is the dumbest knowledge in the world, the dumbest knowledge in the world. The more I study DNA, the human cell, the more I realize how stupid do you have to be to believe that that all just happened one day out of nothing. It had to have came from somewhere. Okay? And it came from God. And God gave me that wisdom for free. I did not go to Bible college. I did not go to university for it. I did not go to college for it. I did not take a course on it. I read it in the Bible for free one day and I believed every word of it. Um, verse 16, the same, same chapter, Job 28. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx of sa or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Where is it that you find pure gold in the Bible? And where are they? They're in heaven, right? And they're just pavement. 
The purest gold, it's so pure you can see through it. And yet, all it is to us in heaven is something to walk on. That's all it is. Pavement, that's it. That tells you what God thinks about gold. Amen? Yeah, amen. Psalm 19, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, ah. Let me read this. Then they go, uh, yea, then much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by then, and, and Courtney and Todd got me a little thing of honeycomb the other day as a gift. And I took it home and I got a spoon out. It was in a little plastic container and it was just, just pure honeycomb with the honey still in it. And I grabbed me a spoon and I thought, man, I'm going to dig into this thing. And I was able to take two bites of it and that was it. It was so sweet. That's all I could handle was two bites and that was it. And the fear of the Lord is much sweeter than that. Amen. Uh, moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. That ought to be your prayer every day. God, those presumptuous those sins that I think I can do every day and get by with, God, keep me away from them too. Keep me back. Don't let sin have dominion over my life ever. I don't want to lose what you have given me. God, I don't. I want to go to heaven when I die. That kind of wisdom comes for free. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and shall be innocent from the great transgression. Boy, I tell you what. When Jesus, when Jesus told them, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou, thou, that thou mayest be rich. That's the kind of gold he was talking about. The wisdom that all the gold in this world cannot buy. And I'd rather have a church as poor as dirt, and that, that did not say amen every time I said somebody say amen. But that they were wise in God's word. They were a wise church in God's word. Let's pray. Father, bless your word. Thank you for it, dear God. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of, of this day. And Lord, we thank you, God, that you examine us. And Lord, show us, Father, open up our eyes. We can be blind, God. I, I can be blind. And maybe this very moment, blind to my own sins, blind to my own secret faults, my own transgressions, my own arrogance, my own ignorance, I can be blind to those things. And God, I require wisdom from you. So Father, keep me from to being like a Laodicean. Give me, give me more wisdom. Give these people in this church wisdom that far exceeds the wisdom of this world. Father, if they just search it out, they'll find it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And bless your word magnified even above your name. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.